Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming along today. Um, on behalf of Disability Equality Scotland and the MSPs, I would like to welcome you to the Scottish Parliament. I'd also like to sort of take this opportunity right at the very beginning to pay thanks to the Scottish Parliament events team for the fantastic support that they've given us throughout this process. It really has been amazing. Um, as, as well as the broadcasting team, um, who've been able to ensure that disabled people up and down Scotland can, can take part today, even though they're not here. And lastly, to Monica Lennon, MSP as well, thank you very much. Um, this event is off the back of our access panel conference from last year, where Monica gave the keynote address, and with us running out of time on that day, we decided to hold a follow-up event today, and, and this is it. So today is about you. It's an opportunity for access panels to ask the questions that they've been looking to ask for, for a long time. We're very privileged to be here today, but time um, is limited, unfortunately. So we only have an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 10 minutes now, actually. Um, so I would ask that everyone remains conscious of this fact and that we don't speak over each other and that we, we don't go off on a tangent. I know that we, at Access Panel Conferences, we like to discuss the wider issues, but today is meant to be very focused, as focused as possible. As far as I'm aware, there isn't a fire alarm planned for today. So if the, in the event that if the alarm does go off, there will be Scottish Parliament events team uh, on, on hand to escort us out of the building. Um, everybody should have a briefing paper in front of them in the little pink folders. Um, it contains some background information about Disability Equality Scotland, as well as all the questions that have been submitted for today. Um, as I said previously, we're limited for time. Um, I will do my best to make sure that we get through as many questions as possible. If we do run out of time, though, um, I'm sure members um, will be happy to take up any further questions that you have at a later date. And our plan is to create a final summary document after today, summarising all the points that were raised, and this will be uh, emailed out to everybody. So our first topic today will be transport, and we'll be going to Ross and Cromarty Access Panel, Sheila and um, Jonah at the, at, down there at the end, for question number one, please. <clears throat> OK, do I have to push this? No, no, you're live. No, no, I'm You're live, live yeah. OK. My question is about accessible public transport because it's, it's essential to enable people to, par to participate in an active life and that includes participating in the access panels. And Highland coaches are used on many of our local bus services. They comply with regulations that state they are wheelchair accessible, but because they have several steps at the entrance, they cannot be used by many people who have mobility issues. What measures is the Scottish Government taking to, to ensure that all people in Scotland have access to accessible and affordable public transport? Okay, that's a, that's a really interesting question. This is, this is obviously something that we, <clears throat> we hear about a lot um, across our uh, events that we hold, our accessible travel events especially. Um, do, do any access panel members or MSPs have any ideas around how accessible travel in Scotland can be made easier for for disabled people. I'm, I'm keen to open this up to, to access panels rather than, than having me sit here and, and, and talk away for the next, next hour. This is all about. Yes, Charles Lister down there. Right, deep. Ed, Charles Lister from Disabilities 5. We came over today, we parked the car at the park and ride in, in the Keevan Ferry Toll. Uh, very fortunately, the bus we got on was an X55, it was a coach. And they've designed the coach so as that the first level of the coach is lower down, <coughs> but the, the other bit of the coach at the back is higher up. <coughs> and Stagecoach designed, uh, designed this particular coach that way for themselves to introduce them all their services. I would suggest that for buses, that all the other coach companies follow that example if they can. So we also hear a lot around rural routes where Ordinary buses that you might see in Glasgow or Edinburgh aren't used um, and they tend to use more coach-like vehicles and this has been a real issue um, that we know with for, for disabled people in terms of being able to get um, wheelchairs on board or even those with mobility issues that don't necessarily use a wheelchair. Um, does anybody else have any other thoughts on this, anything you'd like to input? Arthur Carey, yeah. Uh, Ian, as you well aware, we held a meeting in this building last year about 
accessible legislation. And all the operators and politicians at the moment hide behind the legislation. It's the legislation we need reviewed and changed. It's, n it's not only on vehicles, it's the infrastructure for uh, transport facilities, hotels as well. Uh, many times we'll have members traveling staying overnight. The room is book, uh, shown as being accessible once they book in, and most certainly isn't. So it's the whole legislation we need to review. Until we do that, the operators and elected members will still hide behind the current legislation. Yeah, I mean, I think you made a very interesting and, and important point. And, and one of the issues that we have at the moment is that we have a transport bill going through the Scottish Parliament. It's just finished stage one. Uh, and I've had a number of discussions with different charities, and I'd be interested to get a bit more from yourself and others around what can we do at the transport bill, um, both at a high level, so policy is right, but also at a practical level. And I, I do recognise there is greater difficulties for those who live within rural and have coach services compared to those who live maybe within the central belt of Scotland. But I'm, I, I would be very happy for you and others around the whole issue of transport to feed in practical suggestions which we can look at in regard to um, putting into the transport bill. And I think this is one of the issues um, where we can try to get cross-party support, where we can work, hopefully, with, with other parties to um, get things within legislation, which will then deflect, which I think is a very fair comment you make, that politicians just say, well, we can't do anything because the legislation says that. Well, this is our opportunity in Scotland to have a look at the Transport Bill and see what can be done um, to make life easier uh, for those with disabilities. So without repeating that through every question, please do come back to me and come back to Monica and others, Michelle, others who are here today, with practical suge suggestions around the Transport Bill. And I'm certainly happy to work with others from other parties on that to see what we can get down. Brilliant, that's great. Yeah, just very, yeah, very quickly, thank Hello. you. I'm Michelle Valentine, I'm almost one of the MSPs. Can I just pick up on something you said about hotel access? You said you, when people book and they arrive there thinking that it's going to be accessible and then it isn't. What are the kind of things that are not accessible? Well, quite often they cannot access the shower because there'll be a lip on the shower uh, for the bowl. Uh, sockets for things like kettles are quite often in below a desk. And it's things like that. And there is some hotels that have got deep shag carpets, which means a wheelchair finds it very difficult to negotiate. You know? It's on doorway yeah. width, but well, not on that actual, should yeah. all be covered in building yeah, standards, exactly. being mm -hmm. honest. Mm -hmm. But too often the architects, designers and everything else will work to the regulations, mm -hmm. but they're working to minimum standard right. because they're doing the client's brief, mm -hmm. trying to keep costs down, whereas they should be looking to build best practice mm -hmm. where we could be using that facility for the next 40 years. Wheelchairs, power wheelchairs have got bigger, increased mm -hmm. massively yeah. over the last 10 years, and we can only expect them to continue going that way. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, I am going to move us on to question two. Um, we are so we are so pressed for time, and and, and I know it's. Oh, Colette. Yeah. Colette, do you have a do you have a point? Um, I just wanted to say about the accessibility for the likes of hotels and infrastructure. Um, a lot of the time, we talk about wheelchair accessibility um, <coughs> and mobility accessibility, but there's also. Um, things like visual impairment and yeah. other sensory impairments, such as even this building or new builds, a lot of it is to do with the lighting that is poor and inadequate for visual impaired people, um, colour contrasting, signages that are totally unacceptable for visually impaired or blind users, 
but the colour contrasting um, is, is a major factor to people that have got a visual impairment, but then you've got the sound acoustics where a, for people that have got sensory impairments, such as people that are on the autistic spectrum. So when we talk about accessibility, <coughs> we're really going to have to start thinking about overall that it's not just mobility or wheelchair users. There's so many different issues to do with accessibility that um, we're really going to have to start bringing that into regulation standards for all buildings now. <laughs> and just quickly, lastly, more than books. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree and thank for the support in any private members' bills and the support with any current bills that are going through to improve the legislation on accessibility. But just to, to sum up or, or to summarise, um, for the last year, we received a grant from the, the Big Lottery to take forward a feasibility study to look at investing in access uh, quality standards. Now, we know this doesn't change legislation, um, but what we want to do the feasibility study and the findings from this study does tell us that premises out there and employers, they do need further education um, and they need, the, the awareness of accessibility does need to be raised amongst them. Now, investing in people and investing in volunteer standards works. Um, so why not have an invest in an access standard that, again, it's raising that awareness and it's encouraging and it's offering an incentive for, for premises, hotels, employers uh, to th actually think about their accessibility for visitors, guests, employers, uh, employees rather. Um, so we're currently going through that stage at the moment. Um, it'll probably be another year or so, if I'm being honest and realistic, and, and when those standards will be actually developed, but, and, and dependent on funding as well. That's a, a huge um, a issue as well. Um, but again, any support we can get from MSPs on in tackling accessibility uh, and legislations and bills would be most welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, Okie dokie. I'll take us on to question two now. Before I do quickly, I would just like to, to mention that we do have um, Scotland's first youth access panel with us today from Alva Academy. Um, we've got two, two of the students sitting down the front. This is, uh, this is something that we've, uh, we've been working on with, with uh, the young people from Alva Academy for the past um, year or so. Um, and we've just managed to get the, the access panel off the ground. So they're here today to, to sort of take part and, and listen in on the discussion as well. So, question two, Centre for Inclusive Living, Perth and Kinross. We'll go over to Gillian here. Um, our question was kind of along similar lines, but regarding trains um, and how we can make an impact at a national level on trains. Um, a lot of it was, there was some kind of simple solutions came up there in terms of the booking process, access to trains on a day with ramps and signage, staff awareness, that sort of thing, but even simple changes seem to be quite difficult to make and how we go about trying to do that. Okay, does anybody want to, to add to that? Yep. Hey, hi, uh, Alec from Falkirk Access Panel. We had a, a meeting last month on transport and we had the bus company, taxi company, leader of the council, all the councillors there, and Egbert Rail were the only ones that failed to turn up. So... I think that's across the board. They, they're not interested. Um, we were asking them as well about ramps and about stations, but we got nothing back from them. So obviously we're, we're aware that the, the, the rail infrastructure in this country, is a, a lot of it is Victorian, um, and its suitability for, for, for not just disabled people, for, for, for regular travel, travellers from day to day. I mean, we see that with... Um, trains and, and station infrastructure can be can be extremely difficult to navigate. So, what suggestions do do access panels have possibly in terms of if if, if this were to be fed back to to Network Rail and, and Transport Scotland? What what suggestions? Yeah, so, Linda, sorry. Does my mic go on? Hi, I'm, I'm not sure what happened where in here for answering this question. Um, I'm the, the convener of Disability Quality Scotland. I'm also the convener of the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland, who is a public body that offers advice to Scottish ministers on accessible transport for disabled people. What we have found uh, with Max and what we've really been pushing for is good disability awareness training and for that to be developed with and delivered by disabled people. Um, if we get the training right for the, the, the front-facing staff, for the, the customer-facing staff, then that will assist with a lot, of the, a lot of the issues that are there. 
Um, there are some other things under the, the Rail Accessibility Fund, uh, and aware that, that some of it's uh, still reserved. Um, but we are we are questioning the criteria for accessibility just now, because accessibility has been deemed in the, the stations being step free. Uh, and there's a lot more than just step three to a station being accessibility, such as wayfinding, lighting, acoustics. Um, so we're actively pushing to get the accessibility uh, criteria changed to include some of the other factors um, over a range of disabilities. Um, so that, but I think the key thing is training the staff. Um, if, if we get disabled people to design the training of what they need and how they need help, what works for them, what makes them confident to travel, and uh, if we get disabled people involved in delivering that training to the staff, then I think that will make quite an inroads into it. That's Thank brilliant. you. Robin Wicks. About 18 months ago, I attended the launch of the Accessible Travel Framework. I think it was September 2017, and it was launched by the then Transport Minister. And I'm just wondering whether I'm right to be disappointed that these questions are still coming up. Uh, in isolation from the framework? Aren't they things that should have been covered by the framework? That's the first point. second point I'd like to make is, is that um, in the Edinburgh panel, we, we're consulted by Network Rail, Scott Rail, very frequently. They keep us very busy, especially about passenger assistance. So we took part in a very big consultation um, a few months ago run by the Office of Road and Rail, the OOR. I don't know whether anybody else replied to that one, but that's symptomatic, that's fairly typical of the sort of heavy duty consultations that we find they're doing. So whether they're just coming to us and not to the other panels in different geographies, I don't know, but we are being consulted in a, a very sort of enthusiastic way by Network Rail and the other rail authorities. It could well be that some panels are <clears throat> possibly not being consulted as much by Network Rail or Scott Rail. Um, and that's possibly something for us to take forward in terms of engagement training and working out who all the sort of regional contacts are for a panel. Um, I know we do have a regional community contacts list, um, but that probably needs updated. But no, that's that's a that's a good point, Robin. That's that's uh, one last point, Arthur. Yeah, uh, I'm equally as disappointed as Robin because the 156 is running on the West Highland Line from Queen Street to Malig. A journey of five and a half hours were never accessible, never, even though they were listed as being accessible. In the last six months, ScotRail Transport Scotland have introduced refurbished sets, which has took us back 50 years on accessibility. They're shocking. And Linda is aware I had a meeting with Transport Scotland and ScotRail last week about this very subject. And to go back to the very first point I made, ScotRail just hid behind in Transport Scotland. They meet the Act of 1998. So, and we were never consulted. And up until these uh, trains were introduced, I was the chairman of the Scottish Accessible Transport Alliance. But after the introduction of these, I had to resign because I could not honestly sit around the table with them and speak about improvements when they go and do that. Are these the trains with the, the doors where you have to go open the... Yeah, put your hand out the window and open the no, door from the other know, side? Yeah. No. Uh, the, to open the doors, it's still push pads. Right. But they used to be the size of that coffee cup. Yeah. Now the size of 50 pence piece. They are shocking. They've taken us backwards. I'll just bring Robin in. Lastly. Sorry, I forgot to introduce myself when I first started talking. So I'm Morvan Brooks and I'm the CEO from Disability Equality Scotland. Um, with the answer to uh, your question, your first question, Robin, the accessible travel framework is a 10 year plan. It probably does feel like slow progress or no progress, but there is progress being made in the background. And I can only provide assurances that from Disability Equality Scotland, where we, are part of, where we receive funding from Transport Scotland, we're meeting all our, our object, objectives with the framework um, and they continue to take place as you can understand a lot of the the work we have to talk about it takes a lot of planning to take in place before that implementation starts to feed down and you start seeing changes it's with any sort of project plan that that happens um, so i can only provide assurances from our point 
that we are working in the background to, to take those issues forward. Um, we've recently um, started to, we, we've re recently joined the Scott Rail Stakeholder Equality Group and um, Emma Scott, um, my colleague, with her hand up there, she actually co-chairs that group now. So we've actually got a big opportunity here to actually work with access panels to make sure that their voice is heard on this group. Um, and please contact us, and as well as MSPs in the room here today as well, their support and any time that they are come across it, the opportunity to uh, for engagement with Scott Rail Network, any transport operator, um, support and working together, essentially. That's what we're asking everybody to do in this room today. Start working together to start making these changes happen and start getting our voices heard. Um, our voices are being heard, but we actually need to come up with practical solutions, as yeah. Jeremy said. We do actually need to propose what those practical solutions are. Nobody around the table are, are all going to agree them all at once, but we have to, to start thinking about what are the practical elements in making these changes and actually make those suggestions. Yeah. Yes, the issues are there. We can go on about those issues long enough, um, but we actually have to start saying, well, what actually has to change and to make that happen? Um, so, yeah, that, that's where we're at with that just now. OK, so that brings us on to question three, which is from Tweeddale Access Panel. Um, just over here. Hello, uh, good afternoon. I'm Frank Drummond. I'm the secretary of Tweeddale Access Panel, and our question relates to planning. Uh, I'll read out the question and then tell you the reasoning behind it. Uh, until such time as panels are sufficiently trained and resourced to become statutory consultees in relation to all planning applications, might they be made statutory consultees in relation to any planning applications where it becomes apparent in the course of the application process that the proposals appear to have an adverse impact on disabled people residing in the neighbourhood? Now, this question arises as a result of a, a planning application by a housing association in Peebles uh, to build six flats on a garage site and parking area which belongs to the association. Now, the parking area is bounded on one side by a small development of six houses occupied by elderly and disabled people. These houses are surrounded by other houses on three sides uh, there's a pavement in front of them, then there's a the parking area, then there's the garage site. Of these six houses, uh, four householders are car owners. There are ten blue badge holders. Uh, four, of the car, four car owners are blue badge holders, and uh, six others residing with them are blue badge holders. So at the moment, they're able to park on this parking area outside their houses. Uh, the development proposed by the Housing Association will put back gardens uh, where these people park their cars at the moment, then the houses, and then the parking being provided for the new development and the existing householders will be on the far side of these flats from the, the current parking area. The nearest householder uh, to the new proposed parking area uh, the distance from his front door to the nearest disabled space is 35 metres. And the furthest away one will be about twice that distance. Uh, the reason I've put forward this question, our panel has put forward this question, is that this application was actually lodged on the 2nd of July. Uh, the first objection relating to uh, disability and mentioning blue badge holders was lodged on the 31st of July. Uh, another one on the 3rd of August. The Community Council also raised disabled issues on the 3rd of August. Another one 28th of August. Another one 30th of October. Uh, our panel uh, maybe says something about our profile in the area, although we are known to the Community Council and the local authority. Uh, only came to know of this application. Uh, uh, casually by chance as a result of a, a social engagement of a member over the, the Christmas holiday period where the, one of the tenants was actually present and, and this 
issue was raised, and then the panel got involved. The panel have since lodged an objection to the planning application. Uh, the Housing Association have been in touch, and they say they want to reach a solution which will satisfy their, their current tenants as well as their new tenants and hope will improve the, the parking situation for them. But whatever the result of this actual application, the, the fact remains this has been on the go for more than six months already, and it would have been quite possible for this to have slipped through without the panel having uh, heard anything about it. Hence the question. I think Monica Lennon Scott's wants to come in here. Thank you, as a former town planner, I'm, I'm itching to say something, Frank, but, but thank you to everyone who's come along. It's a, a pleasure to be hosting the event. And there are a number of MSPs here. I see we have uh, Jackie Bailey, we've got Michelle Ballantyne and Jer Jeremy Balfour, you've heard from Mark McDonald and, and, and Maurice Corey. So from across um, different parts of Scotland. I think, and going back to the earlier questions, which were about transport, but led us into building standards as well, um, that, that planning is really important. We have to get it right at the very beginning. And actually, once you get to the planning application stage, if you don't have the right policy framework and the right principles in place, you're going to get it wrong for people and especially for people with disabilities. So I think your examples are a really good illustration about why we need to get it right with the planning bill that's working its way through Parliament at the moment. And I'll be honest, um, and I can speak for my party, Scottish Labour, on this issue, the planning bill is a disappointment because it's just trying to refresh and update previous legislation, which was a bit of a refresh of the previous legislation. So you end up knitting together a bill that doesn't really work. So we've tried to step back and take a sort of first principle approach. What is the purpose of planning? Why do we have a planning system? It shouldn't be this difficult to navigate your way around it. And if that application had been dealt with quickly, you know, your contacts at Christmas would have been completely, you know, cut off because it could have been dealt with a, a lot sooner. So what we are trying to do is embed into the planning legislation because uh, we can't leave these things to guidance is that people's rights, people's human rights have to be um, embedded into to the system. And then we have to have good um, assessments of policy before they get into the plan so that we're not going to um, increase health inequalities and cut off people's opportunities to, to be part of their community, to be active in their community. So in terms of a practical solution, because you are all experts in this room, so we would want planning officers, building standards officers, to hear firsthand your knowledge and expertise and experiences. So that's why we proposed at stage two of the planning bill that uh, disability access panels or access panels should be statutory consultees. We've gone even further actually and said that young people should have rights to be consulted because you know most often you get a neighbour notification, you might see a notice in the local paper, you might be on a community council where you are a st statutory consultee but young people tend not to be engaged in that way. So we think a lot of planning decisions don't just have an immediate impact it can have an impact for a very long time and it's young people like our friends here from Alva Academy who have to grow up and live with the the consequences so I see this as someone who is still a, a paid up member of the Royal Town Planning Institute planners have to let go a little bit and let people into the system because that's how we're going to get better decisions so hopefully another amendment did pass at stage two but with cross-party support um We'll get that in at stage three. But in the meantime, if people do have examples like the one that, that Frank's outlined, please tell your local MSPs, let us know about it. And that will make it easier for us at stage three of the planning bill to try and get these, you know, I think sort of far reaching changes that, that we need. Um, and a bit about young people as well. I mean, I think that, that did get cross party support, but we just need to make sure at stage three that we, that we get all these things into the bill. Michelle Barnes, Obviously, I'm going to echo a lot of what Monica has just said because, uh, I mean, to be honest, the planning bill is a bit of a mess at the moment, but there are potentially some important things in there and we certainly will be supporting getting those through. Um, speaking of somebody who used to be on the planning committee for the Tweeddale area, um, one of the important things is that we do get well informed. You know, planning committee members are, often have quite a small amount of time to make decisions on planning issues. Um, certainly speaking for myself and my own colleagues, we did used to read everything that went on there, particularly objections. So it is important 
that you do object where there is a problem, but it is, I, I absolutely agree. I think a statutory consultation with people who know what they're talking about, and I know there's several going through the borders at the moment that I've had issues with and I've written in about, um, and it's something we really need to get a grip on. We really don't need to wait an ax here. I'm from the Loch Harbour Disability Access Panel, and Highland Region Planning Office send us the weekly list of every planning application submitted to them, and we go through it. So I'm really disappointed that you had to hear about this third hand. So if you contact your planning office uh, in your region and say, we want a copy of the list, they should provide it with you. We don't have to wait in ox, you know? I think, I think for Disability Equality Scotland, that, then that, and that's fantastic, some access panels do have that resource where they will be able to get in touch with their local planning officer, receive plans on a regular basis. Um, obviously, not all access panels are identical and, and not all are, are up to the standard you know, that, that Lock Arbor access panel is. Um, I suppose for us, it's about embedding access panels within a statutory framework and allowing them the, the opportunity to influence without having access as a tick box, as a, oh, we haven't, asked the we haven't asked the access panel, we better go and ask them just in case, you know, that sort of thing. I'm gonna bring in Isabella and then I'll come back to you, Michelle, thank you. In the Isabella Gorska from Stirling Area Access Panel. We are actually recognise consultees along with the community council with our local planning department. We've done it for a number of years and we actually find it does not work. Why doesn't it work? Simply because planning is a public forum. The next stage where a lot of the finer details on access issues is at building control level. That is private. We are allowed no access to that, and that's where it falls down. We've currently changed our agreement with the council, and we're now involved with the architects at a pre-planning stage, which is actually having a lot more success. Also, whenever a planning application is put in, it says on our council website they have to engage with Stirling Area Access Panel. They have to do an access statement. That gives us a bit of comfort, but it's not enough. Why? You've got planning for new builds. You've got planning for change of use of buildings. Where you have change of use of building, they come under, as all planning does, the Equality 2010 Act. We do not have enough case law to support the Equality Act. I can give an example in the Stirling area that a change of use of building for a rape crisis centre. Disabled people could not get into the building because of steps, the toilets were upstairs, all the meeting rooms were upstairs. But that was passed. Why? Because under the Equality 2010 Act, they made reasonable adjustment. They could go and see somebody in their own home. That was deemed acceptable. What I would put to you is with any building, you need to have human rights being adhered to. The basic human right for any individual to be able to enter a building unaided and without asking for assistance. By that, I mean you don't need to ring a doorbell, you don't need to have a ramp brought out to you to allow you to enter that building. You should be able to enter it without having any assistance whatsoever. That would maintain independency and dignity but it needs to be throughout the whole building that people can actually nav navigate through a building without having to ask for assistance. And we're just not seeing that. And it's a very sad fact, we've now got case law on first bus with wheelchair users. We've got another one coming up with Fry's Law with changing places 
But until we get proper case law where we see the Equality Act being enforced, I don't think we're going to see much change in planning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. And just back to, I think, Michelle Valentine, just has been covered because I was actually going to say that right. it's not always at that first point yeah. and each planning department operates slightly differently and you need quite a large resource to be going through every planning application <coughs> to decide whether you need to consult so I think I think there does need to be a targeted notification yeah. otherwise you, you're going to drown in paperwork mm -hmm. I because I think at the moment it's you know on the onus very much of the access panel to go looking for those plans um, Whereas the statutory consultee status would shift it back to the local authority and it would be up to them to come to the to the access panel. Quickly bring in, who was it? John Leddingham, sorry. And then we'll move on to the next question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm John Leddingham, access panel coordinator for Aberdeenshire Council. And what we actually do in Aberdeenshire is uh, the four access panels there will make contact with me on a monthly basis to see how many uh, applications they want to review. I will download the plans and take them along to their meeting on a monthly basis. And so far for this year, we've review, reviewed over 70 applying applications and have sent back over 35 letters to architects, etc. So that's the way we work. No, that's, it's a really, it's a fantastic resource that the Aberdeenshire panels have with, with yourself within Aberdeenshire panel, um, Aberdeenshire Council, sorry. Um, okay, so we're moving on to question four. Um, we're going to be talking about accessible toilets and we're going back to the Centre for Inclusive Living, Perth and Canross. Yeah, so this was just around um, changing place toilets and what a good resource they are. Uh, we have a lot of events in Perth that the events team are trying to make as accessible as possible and they're getting people into the town, but a lot of people won't come because there isn't the toilet facilities for them. And it's how I suppose we get that in the legislation and the planning to encourage people to put changing place toilets in and not just smaller accessible toilets. Yep, Jeremy Balfour. <clears throat> I mean, I think, excellent question. And I think there's definitely been, even in the last 12 months, a massive move around this. Um, I, 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 just within, not a personal, but within a Lothian context, I wrote to 20 of the large areas, such as the Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh Zoo, places like that. And I have to say, the, the, I was expecting a fairly negative response, but the response has been so far very positive. So the Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh have now said, when we do the next development, which is now just going into planning, they will have, an ex they will have a change in place toilet. Uh, the Guile Shopping Centre is now going to be putting one in. So there's been movement. I think the other thing, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm was grateful for the cross-party support um, from, from all parties on this, is that within the new planning bill, there is an amendment down which says any new development over a certain size, whether that's a football stadium or a leisure centre or anything like that, will have to have a, a change in place toilet within it. <clears throat> now that obviously will take time to work through, but I think it is important that both the Scottish Government and all of the other parties have at least signed up to that course of, of, of direction. Um, I, I, think the, I think the one thing we probably just need to think through, and it was interesting, um, meeting with change in place toilets, we were in the Parliament couple of weeks ago, is how many do we need per area? Um, and, uh, you know, I think we don't need one in every department store, and actually they would say that that would be almost counterproductive. So I think we do need a bit of more strategic thinking, but on rural areas that's harder, but of where do we put these toilets, and how do we make sure they're open 24-7 as well, which is, again, within a King Ross and Perthshire area, quite a big, quite a big issue. I mean, I think the final thing is, and again, I was, I've was i been pleased, I, I did a, a local article for the local paper here in Edinburgh on Access Day, which is happening on Saturday, that uh, there is an issue around the purple pound, but this is not just being kind to disabled people, if you can use that patronising language, there is economic benefit. And Glasgow has shown, and Glasgow shopping centres particularly have shown, that if you live in central Scotland, people with disabilities and older people are going to Glasgow, not to Edinburgh, because there's far more change in place toilets. <coughs> so I do think there's an economic argument to have as well to say, if you want people to come to your venue, etc., you need to have this. But I think it's a great question. Yeah. Would anybody else like to come in on that? <coughs> Lynn, I'll bring in Linda, I'll bring in, and, and then I'll bring in Monica. Thank you. 
Thanks, Linda Bamford. Um, just to say as well, with the accessible travel framework, one of the pushes that are coming from the, the framework and the work of the team there is that with the main or all where we can, the, the, the transport termini, uh, that when they've been refurbished or if there's room that change in place toilets go in there as well. And there's quite a big push for that as well. Um, but just picking up on one of the other things that Jeremy said, um, one of the struggles we have progressing things is, is good research and information. Um, we get research and information about um, low income, ab ab about various categories, but when we actually try to drill down to things like the travel patterns of disabled people, the, the, the number of disabled people that would want to but can't use public transport, we always seem to come up against this block that, that we don't have enough good data and enough good research on that. So I suppose my plea would be that, that we need improved to be collecting improved data and research and the needs of disabled people and where the barriers are for them living independent lives. Thank you. Monica Lennon. Thank you. Again, it's a really important question and I think we have made good progress with the Scottish Government. Um, Kevin Stewart, who's leading on the planning bill, I know he was really receptive to, to both Jeremy and my own colleague Mary Fee from the West of Scotland. And as a result of their amendments, you know, we'll see changing place toilets in um, places like stadiums and motorway service stations, museums. But I think more widely, we do have a problem in Scotland with access to public toilets, public toilets are like an endangered species. They're, they're disappearing. I've seen it in my own area. We have some councils now in Scotland who have no public uh, toilets. So when we look at the cuts to council budgets, um, public toilets have not been given priority when councils are having to make difficult choices. Um, I know there's been some hope in some areas like the Highlands and perhaps here in Edinburgh that if the tourist tax is brought in in those areas, that could be a source of revenue to start to put back basic facilities like public toilets, which clearly are important for, for everyone, particularly people with disabilities. But if we want Scotland to be attractive to visitors and to have a, a buoyant tourist industry, we really need that to, to happen. Um, again, I'm quite obsessive about toilets because I do a lot of campaigning around period poverty and access to, to period products and um, spend a lot of time looking at toilets and what they have and what they don't have. But in Edinburgh, Waverley, um, as many of you will know, you currently have to pay and there's a barrier you have to get through and it's 30 pence or 40 pence, I, cannot, I can never remember because it's a different price in Glasgow. So I wrote to Network Rail about the cost of their sanitary products because it's three pounds to buy, I think, two or three tampons, which is ridiculous. And you have to pay to get in and use the toilet uh, as well. So they did commit to remove those charges, although they haven't done it yet, because I was fighting to get a pound coin in their change machine last week and it kept spitting it out and there was a queue of people. So were people desperately waiting to get into a toilet? If you're having to mess about trying to get the right change to get in, it's, it's really not good. So I think there, there's been some discussion. There's lots of cross-party groups in the parliament, particularly look at um, different, you know, health conditions and bowel disease. Um, my, my own mum, who's recently, she's been recovering from bowel cancer, she had to have an operation and she had a stoma and she was waiting to get that reversed on the NHS and it took about 42 weeks. Um, but she had to think constantly about, about toilets and the, the cleanliness of those toilets and um, the accessibility and having a mirror and, and so on. So these things are really, really important. You know, accessible toilets are not a nice thing to have. They're absolutely essential. And I think when we talk about cuts to councils, we talk about that in quite an abstract way. We're talking about people being stuck in their homes because they know if they go out to their local town centre, they can't get to a toilet. So there's things that we're doing, I think, that are having some impact, but we need to do much, much more. Last point, I'm just going to bring in uh, Lucy McDonald of Harris Access Panel. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to bring a point about the, the well, firstly, the planning. When we get the planning applications. Uh, when it gets to us, the plans have already been formed. The problem we have is then discussing with the architects to make changes that those architects do not have the little to no training on access as part of their uh, like university degree course. Uh, and it's something we've been trying to find out how that can happen. In terms of changing places' toilets, we managed to get one into the new uh, very 
come along waiting room and top topper but we missed the ball and the new community centre in the West Nile, Willing Island, it's very rural. Uh, and the problem we have with the changing places was it was too late for them because of the extra funding it caused to put in a changing places toilet. So if there was any way that your small places could get some your communities to apply for funding to get you more changing places. We've got none in the West Niles at present. Tarbot will be the first one as far as we're aware. But the public will not have access to it outside of opening hours. We've tried to ask that as well. Now that's, a, that's a really common theme that we find across a lot of access panels is that when they're trying to engage with architects, um, if they're making pla uh, changes to any plans or anything like that, is that architects have often overlooked the um, very fundamentals of, of accessibility and, and when incorporating that into, into design. Um, okay, going to move on to the next question. We are going to be looking at funding and support. Now, I know that the Aberdeenshire panels have submitted um, a, a fantastic number of questions, but I am conscious of time. It's 10 to 2 already. Um, so I could possibly ask, John, if you could maybe pick one that you think is the most salient for today and um, maybe on a topic that we've not covered yet. If I could ask maybe a little bit of funding. Can the Scottish Government promise to continue to commit to the access panel and support through funding, recognition of our skills and knowledge and providing technical support where needed? Okay, so this um, will relate to the, the access panel grant, which, which access panels currently receive from the Scottish Government. Um, the fund is, is at the moment stands at about £45,000, so that's a fund which is roughly equally split across all access panels um, in the region of about £1,000, works out at about £1,000 per panel, and they can use that for things that will keep their access panel going in terms of expenses, um, room hire, phone costs, email, that sort of thing. They can use their access panel grant, which they claim from us as the, as the umbrella body, and we then reimburse them on, on um, receipt of uh, receipts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, uh, more than come in. So uh, the, 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 the history of obviously the, the access panel grant, uh, it has dis decreased over the, uh, the last sort of three years uh, from the Scottish Government. And the reason being, um, we have um, we have just under 40 access panels across Scotland. Um, they all vary in the number of size of members that they have. They all vary in the, the, the abilities and the capabilities that they have to take work forward and take in, and, and progressing with that engagement. So they're all different shapes and sizes, essentially. And what's happening is that there's been fewer and fewer access panels over the years applying for the access panel grant um, over the years. So obviously, when we report back to Scottish Government, there's no need there for that huge amount of money that was initially provided. Of course, it's our job to make sure that access panels are supported in that process to make sure that they are applying for their access panel grant and spending it how they should be spending it within their local communities and improving access. Now, um, we have been successful with our next round of funding uh, with Section 10, um, where we're supporting access the access panel network. Um, and this, is, this next year has now given us the, the opportunity to, to upskill the skills of the access panel network across Scotland. Um, so we have a training programme that we'll be working on in the next uh, few months, and you will all be receiving communications around that training. Because what's important for us is that you are all well supported as access panel members in the work that you do as the experts in your communities. We are here to support you do that well and, and better as, as much as you can. Um, and of course, by doing that, your activity and your membership is going to increase. So I'm being positive about this, of <laughs> course. Uh, so it will. Um, so of course, you'll be applying for more monies to improve access in your communities. So there'll be a demand and need there to improve them, to, to, to ask for more money, essentially, from Scottish Government to continue to support the Access Panel Network. But of course, it's our role here as the umbrella body for access to the Access Panel Network to, to, to advocate 
the work that access panels do, and we very much do that every single day of our, our daily, daily lives, essentially. Um, and of course, my plea again to the MSPs in the room, if we can ask you to continue to support the network in that way as well. And, and it's, it's all of us coming together, I, I sound like a repeat, repeated record at times again, apologies, but it's about us all working together and any opportunities that do come up that they get flagged up, we take them forward together. Does that help answer that? Yeah, cool. Yeah, just quickly, Sandra Howard, yep. Yeah. Sandra Howard from Aberdeen City Council. Delighted to hear about the, the funding situation and the, you know, the commitment to training because there's an urgent need at Aberdeen to have a fully effective functioning access panel. Given the amount of changes that there are in infrastructure in Aberdeen City, we really welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to question nine on the uh, question paper, which is from Harris Access Panel. Uh, yes, uh, we are sick for we live on an island, and we're just wondering if you know, additional funding could be made available for panels like ours who have additional costs due to travel. Uh, for example, this trip to this meeting today would cost our panel around four hundred pounds. If we were go if we were to go to an additional meeting on the mainland, that would be our budget gone. I there's also the issue that I need to have a carer with me so that means I can be paid twice. Uh, so it's just, I, I do feel like there's not an understanding that there's the, the difficulty in island panels tra travelling to and from the mainland, even within the island, it's a lot. You know, to get strong with where a lot of means are, an hour and a half, to get to the mainland, it's a ferry, or here, a flight, it costs a lot. Um, comp my light. I completely agree. Um, have the conversation with us. That's all I ask. Start this two-way communication between access panels and us, your umbrella body for the access panel network. There is a, a set budget there on a yearly basis from the Scottish Government, 45,000, and we've got to split that across, um, obviously, under 40 access panels. Um, Again, like I said before, not, there's access panels not claiming nearly enough that we would have expected them to claim, and there's access panels claiming more because their activities are more. But have the conversation with us because we will help and support with accessibility as much as we can for any access panel. We are also working and trying to educate others, as well as ministers and MSPs, on different ways of communicating as well. So, yes, it's nice to see people face to face at coming to events like this. Um, we have live streamed this event today with the, with the hope that we can try and get people more engaged in the work that we are doing, with the opportunity to hopefully engage through Twitter. So, we will be following that up after this today. Um, and webinars is, a, is, is an area that we're going to look into going forward with a lot of our events. We do run a lot of events across our trans, transport events, engagement events that we do, um, and uh, general roadshow events that we do across Scotland. We do hear feedback that we're not getting across everywhere in Scotland. We are only six people in our organisation, and uh, it's difficult to get across the whole of Scotland in one year. So every year we, we try and map out different areas of Scotland that we've not been to. You all want our attention, you all want it now. We do try and split ourselves up quite evenly and, and give you the support that you, you greatly need. Um, we also look at other ways of communicating um, through our BSL videos that we've been doing in partnership with Deaf Scotland. Um, easy read to work to make sure that our, the information that we are communicating is accessible as well. But again, suggestions and working together, tell us what you need. We'll do our best to provide that. Okay. Yeah, yeah Linda? Just to come in in the back of what Morvan's saying, um, the, the Board of Disability Equality Scotland have had quite a bit of discussion recently about revamping the communication strategy. Um, this year's communication strategy is just about to be signed off and one of the, the underpinning actions to it um, is about using the opportunity from this year's Access Panel Conference 
to focus the, the day round about how we improve two-way two communications and how we, we, we just get that dialogue going about how Disability Equality Scotland as the umbrella organisation can support the access panels just now and moving forward in their growth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have 15 minutes left um, and we have more than, I think, probably about five questions to go. What I'm going to say is uh, I'll move on to Edinburgh Access Panel question number 11. After that, East Renfrewshire Access Panel question number 12. <coughs> and then uh, one of either question 13 or 14. I will leave that down to Arthur Carey to decide which one he, he wishes to choose. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just reminding everybody to keep discussions as, as, as brief as possible um, and we yeah. can get to the end of, end of the questions by, uh, in 15 minutes. So, uh, Robin Wicks. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, let me pray to the question because we, we've covered quite a lot of the question already. Um, as Ian and Morvin said, our income has reduced. I reckon it's about 40% since 2017. Um, as well as income reducing, though, uh, let's think about costs as in addition, because costs are increasing. Taxi fares are increasing year by year. Our website fees have increased by more than 100% in the last two years. So I think there's two things. One is the income, and the other is the, uh, the cost that we need to manage. And to be honest, it's becoming more and more of a challenge to manage the budget each year. I know in, in practice, you often have money left over. And we're grateful for that at the end of the year. But we can't assume, at least I don't think we can assume, that that's always going to be the case. Can you see, to answer this? Yeah, so, I mean, we've, we've had discussions on a number of occasions around things that, that the access panel can and can't apply for. There's, there's very little things that um, access panels can't use their, their grant for, in that sense, that it's fundraising, political activities, that sort of thing. Um, like Morvan said, if there's something that you need, have that two-way conversation with us. I know you do, but to, to all access panels, um, if there's something that you've identified as a, as a need for your panel, have that conversation with us, approach us. You know, we're not going to bite your head off. Um, Robin Wick says, we, we, we often have access panels who don't claim their grant. Um, so this will have a, a, a knock-on effect across the entire network because those panels that don't claim their grant, it will then mean that we have a reduced grant the following year. So... Um, yes, so I'll, I'll bring Morvan in here. Um, just to, to remind you again, work, work, to work collectively as a network. Um, let us know if your costs are increasing and if you're struggling to manage that budget. Um, as a collective, we could look at getting a special deal for a website provider, for example, to provide uh, websites, which we, we already do have that offering in place. Um, but if you're not aware of it, um, or you, you were quite happy with using what you've got, talk to us. And again, that's what we're here for. Tell us what your issues are, what your problems are, um, and we'll help you go through, to go through that and go forward. Um, that's what we're here for. And, and, that, and again, going back to that whole two-way communication through our communication strategy, it, that's what we want to encourage. Um, and again, by working collectively, we come up with the solutions together. We're then communicating to MSPs and ministers what those solutions are and the practical solutions. And, and the, it, it works for us all. And it, at the end of the day, we've all got one thing in common. We all want to improve accessibility in Scotland. Absolutely. Um, and I'll just bring in Charles Lister very quickly. OK, Thank very you. quickly. Yep. Since the Equalities Act in Fife, our funding has dropped dramatically. So Fife Council, for instance, cut us to zero. Our own, only f uh, government funding then was coming from the access panel income, and that's been dropping, that's dropped down to £1,000. Now, we are getting funding from other sources, but it's, it's a pain. It's, it's a struggle, and it's very difficult to actually uh, continue and be sustainable because we aren't getting the income that we, we are used to, and it's very difficult for disabled people to do some of the things that people who are able can do. So we need funding to pay people to actually do work for us. So somebody should be really looking at that, otherwise there'd be no access, well, there'd be no access panel, there could be no access, access panel in five, and that might actually go all, all around the country. So yet people need to put on the thinking caps of how we can be funded. And uh, lastly, Monica Lennon. Thank you. Not to be too gloomy, but in the outside world, planning 
departments, um, the axe has fallen on them pretty, pretty sharply. So in the last few years, about a quarter of local authority planners, or including the, the national parks, have gone. Those jobs no longer exist. And um, I think spending overall in those departments is down by just under a third. So that's, that's pretty serious. And that means there's a lot of expertise and experience has gone as well. I think that makes the work that you do in access panels even more important because ultimately it's about the outcomes. It's not about plans and bits of paper and ticking boxes. It's about what are the outcomes for our communities. So I think if we want to get better planning decisions, we have to support and properly resource access panels. Now, I'll leave the internal politics of who's claiming what to, to uh, Ian and Morvan and, and their team to sort out. But what I would say is that attached to the planning bill is some extra money for planning, um, but it's for something very specific and it's for local place plans. Now, some of you in the room might think local place plans are a good idea. I'm quite sceptical about them. What I think we should be doing is investing in what we know works just now, and we know that access panels do work. They're really important, they're really effective. Others have touched on the fact that we have professionals like architects, engineers, planners, building standards uh, people uh, and others who all have a role in the planning system who get a little bit of training or like no training and maybe we've missed a trick today we should have invited some of those professional bodies to come and hear what we all have to say so we can do that I'm sure at a future date but it has to start in the the lecture rooms I mean, people are on site when they're doing their their training and, and their professional development but of course there's ongoing uh, continuing professional development opportunities too. So what I would say, you might want to look at the, the financial memorandum attached to the planning bill, because I think there's about a million pounds there which would go towards local place plans, which I think are actually going to kind of get in the way of how we do development planning. But let's make sure we've, we've got community councils and access panels working together where they exist and that they're all properly resourced. And that's why I think you've been quite clever about this. If you get um, statutory recognition then there should be resources that, that follow with that. Thanks very much, Monica. Um, OK, question 12 is from East Renfrewshire Access Panel, uh, Colette Walker. Do you want me to read it out, Colette, or are you OK reading out? Um, cool. um, again, we've, we've highlighted it slightly, but um, East Renfrewshire um, Access Panel is a fairly new um, panel that um, launched in November. What I'm wanting um, to know is, um, how can we ensure that um, access panels are being consulted fully by council and private developers so that all indoor and outdoor spaces are consulted on from the, from the get-go? Because I have spoke to quite a lot of architects and engineers at, at different meetings and even local councillors, and they actually don't even know what an access panel is. So but that's quite worrying to me, um, that they're maybe looking at building regulation standards and they're maybe thinking they're ticking a box. But then when we come forward and we say, no, that's completely inaccessible and they don't understand the reasons why, but they don't even know what an access panel is. So is there anything that the MSPs can do to ensure that there's legislation there that access panels are completely affiliated and they know what an access panel is through the building regulation standards? Possibly, yeah. I mean, this is this is probably something for Disability Equality Scotland to take forward when, you know, with, with our role as the umbrella body in terms of awareness raising for access panels across Scotland. Um, exactly how we do that will be, I suppose, a consultative process with the access panels. You know, we're not going to make a decision and run with it without talking to the access panels first, especially if it's an awareness raising campaign for the access panels, we would want to make sure that it's, you know, anything for the access panels involves them too. Um, two minutes in terms of this question. Uh, does anybody have any ideas in, um, with regard to, yeah, bring in Mark McDonald, yeah. Mark McDonald, MSP. I would say that one of the things that access panels themselves could do is to invite their local politicians to come and meet them and speak to them. Um, whether that's yeah. locally elected councillors who have specific remits, or whether that's MSPs and MPs, um, in order to make them aware that you're there, the issues that you're raising, and how we as politicians can best work together with you to raise your concerns at a local level so that you become essentially the go-to people. So when an issue is coming up in the time period between just now and hopefully 
uh, access panels becoming statutory consultees, although that would apply to planning, it wouldn't necessarily apply to other areas. The politicians are aware that they can make contact with you and say, what are your thoughts in relation to this? Are you aware of this change that we're considering? What would be your views? I can then feed them into the process. So I think that's a, a proactive step that access panels themselves could take, is if you don't think your local politicians know who you are or what you're about, write to them and let them know and invite them to come and meet you. You might not get 100% uptake, but you'll at least get some politicians who will come and see you and who will then be able to be your advocates within the local authority, within the parliaments, uh, in order to advance the points that you want to raise. Okay, so we have five minutes left, one question to go. Now, I know I said um, uh, there, there's two questions for the Carbor Access Panel, but it might be interesting if we hear around the egress from a building. We've heard a lot... Brilliant, that's, that's fantastic. Thanks, Arthur. Because that is the most important is, yeah. uh, regard Thank safety. You. As Isabel said early, earlier, there is access statements should be provided with every planning application. Sadly, that's not the case. But egress is never included in a planning access statement. Now, that should, we think, should be a mandatory requirement because Emergency evacuation out of a building is equally as important as getting into the building. In fact, I would say it's more important. And we've also got to take into consideration your lifts, because uh, there's conflicting information regarding lifts. Some people say don't lose a lift in the case of a fire. Other people tell you to use a lift. And it's down to the proprietor of the building now to provide his evacuation strategy. So that should be included in the planning application. Thank you. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts around egress from a building? Uh, yeah, quick, as well, thank you. I think you've raised an extremely important point here because whenever we go out, whenever we go out to have a look around buildings, the first thing we always ask for is their emergency evacuation plan. And it's quite amazing how many buildings will flap about and you're lucky if you actually get it. They may well have one, but people don't actually know where it's located. So I think safety on exit is not important. And I think, you, you know, you've raised an extremely important thing that should be in planning. Does anybody else maybe bring in one last speaker before we close? Can I just say... Yeah, of course. I don't know if anyone from the government was invited to speak. I know everyone's got busy diaries, but a number of the MSPs who've been here today, I know some have had to, to leave now, but I'm sure we've all been taking notes and what we can do if we don't know the exact answers, we can submit written parliamentary questions, we can um, write to the minister and in our own areas we can contact the local authorities. So I represent Central Scotland and that covers North Lanarkshire, South Lanarkshire and Falkirk. So um, we can take these issues up locally as well. So I don't want anyone to leave today thinking you didn't get an answer to your question or that's the end of it. As I say, there's a number of MSPs here, um, but we'll speak to... Um, to colleagues and if there's things that you want MSPs to, to raise, um, it might be that it's better to come from party spokespeople like myself or from the local member so we can do that because much of what we've talked about today here, it's not, it's not party political. We have to work on a cross party basis and that's why we've talked about Jeremy and Mary having amendments that were quite similar. That's the kind of stuff where we get the business done in the parliament because it's a Parliament of Minorities, um, and I think today has been, been really useful, but I just wanted to, to make that point. Thanks. Okay, so if, if anybody doesn't have any more questions, I think that, that brings us to the end of um, all the business that was submitted by, by Access Panels, and we, we've managed to finish two minutes just ahead of schedule, so that was, that was great. Thank you very much to everybody for attending today. I hope you found it useful. If you did, let us know your thoughts. If you didn't, let us know so that we can <laughs> we can do better next time. Um, you know, but we nev we're never perfect. We're always aiming to do better. Um, we will be having uh, another access panel conference this year. This obviously isn't the access panel conference. There will be the, the ordinary access panel conference. So if any MSPs are, are interested in attending, you're, you're more than welcome to come along again. I um, it. <laughs> yes, yeah, Monica was there last year and it, she, it was thoroughly enjoyable. So, um, 
Yes, so thank you very much again for everybody coming along. Thank you to Alpha Academy for taking time out of the school today. Thank you to the broadcasting team. Thank you to the events team at the Parliament as well. Thank you. <laughs>